Hello friends and welcome to everybody except for people who are Google doctors. I have no earthly idea what's happening with my neon sign back there. I've never seen it do that. <laughs> Tried to fix it for like 15 minutes and um, I gave up. Ooh, itchy. Ooh. As I said, thank you for being here and welcome to your favorite series on the internet that you never know when it's coming because of who I am as a person. Today's movie has been highly requested. Today we are talking about a Cinderella story. <gasps> now friends, as you know, countless versions of the Cinderella story have been made over time, dating it back as far as like 1899 or something. We got the Disney one that we all watched as a kid. We got Ever After with Drew Barrymore, who delighted audiences by oh. chucking rocks at her prince and sucker punching one of her evil stepsisters. <laughs> Owie. What else? There was Ella Enchanted with Anne Hathaway. She karate chopped a bunch of elves. And then we have this one, A Cinderella Story, starring our girl Hilary Duff, Chad Michael Furry, and my all time favorite female comedian who I literally dream of meeting one day. Jennifer Coolidge. You're not very pretty and you're not very bright. In this version of the classic tale, Hilary Duff must find her courage to turn her secret cyber relationship with the guy from the OC into a face-to-face -face romance by finally meeting him at the high school Halloween slash homecoming dance. <laughs> all my breath. Now what I like about this version of the story is that in contrast to older versions where the prince saves Cinderella from whatever her miserable circumstances are, um, in this one Cinderella saves herself. Thank you very much. I'm moving out. So put on your tanning goggles kids. Let's fry our brains with a Cinderella story. Mmm, so moist. <laughs> Hey, it's me again. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh, or as we like to say in my household, Hello Fresh. HelloFresh delivers seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients right to your door. They make cooking at home very easy, very fun, affordable, and most importantly, oh my gosh, delicious. Oh, so good, that is amazing. They have tons of healthy options, like they have low carb options, low calorie options, vegetarian, pescatarian, every recipe. They pack it full of fresh produce that they actually source from farmers. And it actually gets to you faster than most grocery stores get their produce. So you're getting produce at its peak freshness. Hence the name HelloFresh. <laughs> HelloFresh cuts out all of the stressful meal planning and prepping. I feel like I have my own cooking show with HelloFresh because everything's in like pre-measured amounts. So when we use it, we usually have dinner ready in like 30 minutes or sometimes even 20 minutes if you go for one of the quick and easy options. I am 100% on board with saving time and the average trip to the grocery store is like 41 minutes or so. So do the math. Every time we make a HelloFresh meal, I feel like I learned something about cooking and it's always a 10 out of 10 good and fresh our friends amber and benji are the ones who actually told us about it like two years ago and i wish we had gotten on board with it sooner and the coolest part is that HelloFresh gives back last year they donated four million meals and they're continuing to step up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis so we have convenient we have time saving we have affordable we have fresh we have delicious we have sustainable we have easy is there anything else that you could possibly ask for in a meal subscription service i don't think so so if you're interested in trying out HelloFresh, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use code JamieSaid14 to get 14 free meals, free, plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com, and when you're checking out, use code JamieSaid14. Thank you so much again to HelloFresh for partnering with me on today's video. And now, back to the show. Tuscan pork. Yep, oh, and here comes a visitor. Stop visiting. Visit. We're back. God. So the movie opens with a flashback, taking us back to 1994, where a year 2000 BMW is parked on the side of the road. It's from the future. So our main character, Sam, played by Hilary Duff, she's kind of narrating the flashback. Although being raised by a man put me behind in the makeup and fashion departments. She's reminiscing about how she was raised by a single dad and it was so great. He played sports with her while this lady and her baby watched. Cute. So we find out during this very long intro that 
Sam's dad owned a diner back in the 90s called Hal's Diner. And here's where we immediately start to see some familiar faces. We got Marcy from Jerry Maguire. I'm just kidding. Her name is Regina King. She's a really good actress, but still to this day when I see her, I just think of shoe, car. Clothing line, soft drink. We also got the late, great Mary Pat Gleason. But more important than anybody in this movie, we have the hilarious, the buxom, the beautiful, Paulette Bonafonte herself, Jennifer Coolidge. Gosh, I can't tell you how long I've been waiting to finally review a movie that she's actually in. Gone are the days where I try to look like her and superimpose her into a movie with a green screen. <laughs> she's here, she's in this movie. It's gonna be great. How does she do the face? I think it's like this. Is that it? So Jennifer Coolidge plays Fiona. Fiona. The Botox obsessed gold digging sun worshiper who marries Sam's father. <laughs> Along with my new stepmother came her twin daughter. And right off the bat, you can tell that she is the evil stepmother in this movie. Just look what she does to Sam in this clip of them posing right after the wedding. We were going to be one big happy family. Oh. Once enough. Are you sure, Fiona? Because I feel like your daughters maybe could have smiled. I don't know. Less weird. So one night, Sam's dad is reading Sam a story about Cinderella. <laughs> Get it. But he's also like giving her life advice at the same time. Kind of seemed like he was just taking inspirational quotes and barking him at her. Dreams come true. Day you'll build your own castle. Fairy tales aren't just about finding handsome prince, fulfilling your dreams, it's standing up for what you believe. You look carefully. Never let the fear of striking out keep you from playing the game. That's right. So anyway, he proceeds to tell her that princes come from Princeton. Where do princesses go to college? They go uh, where the princes go. They go to Princeton. Which will end up sparking her lifelong obsession with Princeton University. And then he gives a very important foreshadowing quote. This book contains important things that you may need to know later in life. Remember that. Well, suddenly, guys, there's an earthquake. You can tell it's an earthquake because of their facial expressions. Ah! What was a little weird to me was this was supposed to be the Northridge quake, which was an actual earthquake that occurred on January 17th, 1994. Around 4.30 a.m., which is kind of an odd time for a bedtime story. <laughs> But what do I know about parenting? So dad of the year decides that he's gonna leave his little bitty daughter alone upstairs during the earthquake because his new wife yelled, help! 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 God! <laughs> Can I just address the dads in the room? Would you do this? Would you like abandon your nine-year-old child in a bedroom doorway so that you could go tend to Jennifer Coolidge? I mean, I would, don't get me wrong. I'm just kidding, um, I thought this was appalling. He doesn't even say anything. He's not like, get under the bed or anything. He just leaves and then dies, I guess. That's right, guys, her dad died. And they don't really explain exactly what happened. You just know he died in the earthquake. And from then on, the only fairy tales in my life were the ones I read about in books. But we don't feel sad, do we? Because it wasn't written, acted, directed, or edited in a way that would make us feel any emotion. <laughs> So it turns out Sam's father did not leave a will. So evil stepmother Fiona inherits everything. She gets the house, the diner, Sam herself, everything. Sam ends up getting confined to this room, like in the attic. It's a Cinderella story, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward eight years. Sorry, I just wanted to lean forward. That wasn't that dramatic of a sentence. So Sam is grown up now in the form of our main squeeze, Hilary Duff, who is terrible at yawning. <sighs> I feel like the director could have asked for at least one more take of that. So Sam plays just like an overworked, overstressed, straight A student who is again, obsessed with the thought of getting into Princeton University. She's got some really good artwork on her wall. Maybe don't list art as one of your strong suits on your Princeton application. <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> Hey, you know what I like? I like that now when my Jennifer Coolidge voice randomly comes out, it's not weird. So Fiona communicates with Sam through this radio thing on her desk. She's like, bring me my breakfast. Bring me my breakfast. I want a hot dog. <laughs> Just kidding. Is this the Norwegian salmon that I asked for? Only the best. You know, it cost a fortune to fly that stuff in from Norwegia. <laughs> That was actually funny. So meanwhile, Sam's step sissies are synchronized swimming when suddenly, Say that five times fast. When suddenly one of them farts. Oopsie. Which I am not going to make fun of because again, I am mature. There will be no fart jokes in today's episode. None. <laughs> okay, maybe just one. 
So anyway, Fiona and Sam are chatting. It's a good convo, but I just felt like there was something lacking. I wanted to take it to the next level. And I just thought maybe it should have been something like this. Jennifer, what gives? I thought I was doing this scene as your body double. Look, I got all ready. Mm-hmm, I can tell. Yeah, I've even been practicing your voice and sprayed myself with this Norwegian perfume to smell like you. Yeah, it cost a fortune to fly that stuff in from Norwegia. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, so why don't you get up and let me do okay. the scene? Oopsie. Ew! Stop what it! What are you doing just standing there? Get to work. I'm confused. Are you doing the scene or am I? Figure it out because I skipped school to be here. People go to school to get smarter so that they can get a job. You already have a job. Yeah? Well, being your body double is not what I wanted in life. It hurts my vocal cords and my face. Come on, get going. Fine. But you know what? Count me out of that date movie project. That script is terrible. It's not a comedy. Rather be Stifler's mom 10 times over. Okay, I know I said I wasn't gonna transform into Jennifer Coolidge and put myself in the movie, but I lied. So anyway, Sam heads to work at the diner, which is now called Fiona's. And this scene is just very <laughs> chaotic. Help me! You can tell the writer like really wanted to add some comic relief, but he or she, wait, who wrote this? Lay Dunlap. She wanted some comic relief in this movie and sometimes it works, especially with Jennifer Coolidge, but most of the time the jokes just don't land. You call that grade A beef. Well, that cow must have cheated on his test. I'm trying to watch my weight. It ain't going nowhere. <laughs> the falls are dramatic. And the dumbest part is that everything that they serve at this diner has salmon in it. Because Fiona is, ob is obsessed with salmon, I guess. That's enough with the salmon. You already made a salmon omelet, salmon soup, and salmon pudding. Ew, salmon pudding? <clears throat> Can you imagine? Jamie, don't knock it till you try it. Okay. <laughs> So Regina King's character's name is Rhonda. Rhonda's the bomb. She's known Sam her whole life. She worked at the diner when Sam's dad was alive and she has just seen the injustice. She sees how she gets treated by Fiona. She gets it, you know, she's the fairy godmother in this little parable. So she tells Sam like, go to school. I got this covered. I will hold down the salmon shack. So Sam heads to school. And now this is one of those movies that like boggles my mind a little bit, maybe because I grew up in Missouri. But I just, who has time to do all of that stuff before school? school starts. Is that a, just a California thing? Like how come in movies people have so many hours of daylight to do things before school? My school started at 7. Everybody was a zombie. You had to leave the house at like 6 30 depending on where you lived. Half the time it was still dark outside depending on what time of year it was. But everybody in movies has time to work before school, synchronize swim, physically go to a coffee shop and talk to their friends for ever. In full hair and makeup all before the bell rings? I don't buy it, but I digress. So then we get to meet Sam's bestie, Carter. They say he's a rapper, but I say no. Just kidding, he's actually an actor. He's a method actor. I am a method actor. That's why he always looks different. I forget, I like the song lyrics for this part. So we get to school, we meet some more characters. We got this girl who does the morning announcements. We got Shelby Cummings. Well. If it isn't Shelby Cummings. <laughs> She's obviously the cool, like popular girl that every tween movie has, but I just, I feel like they could have given her a cooler name than Shelby Cummings. Because all I can think about is Shelby coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> I'll see myself out. Seriously, we, we gotta take a break. I'll be right back. Hey guys. We're back, and Sam can't find a spot to park. She can't find a Perkins spur. Sam, watch out, watch out. <laughs> Peeps keep cutting her off, you know, like these dudes who have cool dude laughs. <laughs> totally cool, bro. Nobody will let her park for school. She's getting frustrated, but then she gets distracted by the beautiful, the charming, weird facial expression making cool guy in school, Austin Ames. Austin Ames is played by Chad Michael Murray, the early 2000s heartthrob from One Tree Hill that all my friends were obsessed with, for which I made fun of them constantly. 
That was kind of mean. So right before class, Sam gets a text from her secret admirer. See you later. Ah, uh, yes. The secret admirer beckons. She's got this little relationship going on with someone online that she's never met who calls himself Nomad. He's Nomad and she is Princeton girl. And from the context of the messages, you can tell that they actually go to the same school. Nomad refers to one of their teachers, Mr. Rothman. Well, I'm thinking that Professor Rothman's dissected. Well, too many frogs. <laughs> Ribbit, ribbit. Wait, is that how you spell the word ribbit? I know it's not like a real word, it's an onomatopoeia, but I thought like the generally accepted way to spell ribbit was ribbit. <laughs> what kind of frog what kind of frogs are you around, Chad? They don't say ribet, ribet. It's weird. Hillary thinks it's funny though. She's like, LOL. <laughs> I mean, L-O-J. Well, secret admirer guy wants to meet, but Sam's not quite ready. But little does she know that Nomad, her secret admirer, is actually Austin Ames. By the way, can I just say it kills me that the main characters' names in this movie are Austin and Sam because those are my nephew's names. What are you doing? Jamie. I just cannot get over it. I say those two names on a daily basis. My bird says those two names. I absolutely can't hear the names Austin and Sam together without thinking of my nephews, and I just think it's so funny. Agree. So Austin and Sam. Who, us? No, the ones from the movie are chatting throughout the day, and it's just very cringe. You're not a guy, right? So the way they kind of did this scene is you hear the messages they're sending each other out loud, like in their own voiceovers. I am not a guy. And I just love and cherish the way Chad Michael Murray expresses the messages on his face. You're not guy right if you are i'll kick your butt <laughs> no nobody makes those faces when they're texting let's make this a little more realistic okay rolling on floor laughing hysterically that's more like it oh god he keeps doing it i don't know what's worse his facial expression or her wording choice <laughs> we should turn in yes hillary we should turn in <laughs> It has been a fortnight since I've gotten a proper slumber. The conversation keeps getting weirder. Austin progresses from making weird faces to like weirdly echoing what he's writing. The hand for the hand. The lips. Take it stop. Long story full of weird faces long, he ends up asking her if they can finally meet at the homecoming slash Halloween dance. Will she do it? Will she meet her cyber crush face to face at the dance and be all like, hey, ASL. Let's find out when we come back. See you after the break. Hey friends, we're back. And I would like you to meet Austin Ames' dad, who I don't think has a name in this movie. <laughs> Austin's dad owns a car wash place, and of course he has employed his son. And Austin's dad really wants him to go to USC, but guys, the thing is, that's his dream. It's not Austin's. What's with all those college brochures in your bedroom? I'm just trying to keep my options open. You don't need any options. You're gonna go play USC football, you're gonna graduate, and then you're gonna manage this business. What a unique plot. So Austin and Sam. Who was? No, the ones from the movie. Austin and Sam run into each other because Sam comes to get a car wash and they have a little banter. Well, you need a wax. Excuse me? I meant the car. Can you blame her for being offended by that? I certainly would have. Well, you need a wax. Excuse me? So this next scene with Jennifer Coolidge, where she's breaking it to Sam that she needs her to work all night at the diner and miss the dance. It isn't really a relevant scene, but it's so funny because Jennifer Coolidge has the whole conversation with her tanning goggles on. Also her towel just kept like shifting places between cuts. It wasn't really spliced together very well. She gives Sam some very profound advice. You're not very pretty and you're not very bright. I'm so glad we had that talk. So am I. And then she like hurts herself. <sighs> so to reiterate, because Fiona, the evil stepmother is so evil, Sam does not get to go to the homecoming dance to meet her prince. She has to go work at the diner at the salmon place. And to make matters worse, while she's at the diner, she ends up having to wait on the cool kids. Well, if it isn't diner girl. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare alert. Austin Ames is there, Shelby Cummings, that annoying guy who did that weird laugh. She's the worst. Oh, he's still doing it. He's doing the laugh. <laughs> so things heat up while Sam's taking the cool kids' orders. Sam makes a hilarious joke. What can I get here that has no sugar, no carbs, and is fat free? Water. Water? <laughs> that was so 
funny. She should do stand up. So Shelby orders an iced tea. The laughing guy orders an iced tea, and then nobody else at the table orders anything else. Then I'll have an iced tea. Make that two. And uh, you know, I'm still waiting on that breakfast burrito, diner girl. <laughs> You're saying this correct, friends. Six people went out to a diner for only two of them to order iced teas. <laughs> A waitress's dream. So Austin decides that this is suddenly a good time to break up with Shelby. He wants to do it in private, but Shelby's like, no, anything you want to say to me, you can say in front of my peeps. Anything you say to me, you can say in front of my peeps. Yeah, Austin, say it in front of her peeps. Okay, I want to break up. Austin dumps Shelby and then everybody leaves. So again, six people came out to a diner for only two of them to order iced teas and then not drink them. Movies. So then Zorro shows up. Have no fear. Zorro. Gotcha. <laughs> it's actually her friend Carter, you know, the method actor. Carter's character is just incredibly, I hate to say it, but unfunny. And frankly, a little questionable. <laughs> go ahead, girlfriend. If she wants to hurt you, she's gonna have to go through me. You go ahead, girlfriend, do you think? Call me girlfriend one more time. So Carter really wants Sam to leave work and go to the dance, as do all of the other employees, made very evident by all of the over-explaining that they do in this scene. It's time for you to find your own bliss. You're always studying, you're always working. You need to take some time for yourself. Yeah, why don't you go out and bust a move? <laughs> Put your freak on! I'm sorry, the phrase is actually get. Get your freak on. Get it right or pay the price. Anyway, Sam decides, you know what? You guys are right. I'm gonna go screw Fiona. I'm gonna go to the dance, meet my true love. But there's just one problem. I can't go. She doesn't have a costume. I don't have a costume. But never fear, kids. Rhonda's here. Get it? Because Rhonda's the fairy godmother in this little Cinderella scenario. So they leave the diner, they go to a costume shop, and we are blessed with a clothes trying on montage because it's a Hillary Duff movie. Oh, hell no. And out of all the clothes trying on montages I've seen, this one has to be the worst. The director or writer or whoever just packed on as many terrible jokes as they possibly could. Oh, it No way. You're killing me. It's so Friday. Buddy, 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 buddy. <laughs> like the over dramatic facial expressions, I just can't. Do it. <laughs> Can someone make a movie out there without any cliches? Has that been done before? Should I do it? Just kidding, I never could. So they end up not even getting a costume at the store because Rhonda remembered she has like a spare wedding dress. Why did you even go bother Vern to begin with? Sam needs a costume. No, no, Rhonda, I am closed. Oh, come on. Poor Vern, don't you have to be back at the diner? What's happening? So anyway, she ends up wearing, again, Rhonda's spare wedding dress that she just has, and she pairs it with this beautiful lace Lady Zorro looking mask. No one will ever know it's you, Hillary. No one would make that connection. Meanwhile, at the homecoming dance, things are weird. Are we having a cat fight? Sam's stepsisters fall down the stairs. <laughs> Wait, what was that noise? <laughs> that was worse than her pool fart. I like this teacher who looks at the camera. I always love when I catch that. It just makes my day. It's like for a brief moment, we're reminded that this is just a movie and that there's a camera guy there. Without this moment, I would have thought that this movie was real life. So Sam shows up wearing a blanket because she can't reveal herself yet. And she tells Carter she has to be back by 12 p.m. sharp. So he sets an alarm in her phone, which you can tell he's for sure doing. Why you always lying? And remember that, friends. Remember the phone alarm. So Sam makes her entrance and it's very... Hillary Duff esque. Hillary just kind of masters that very coy, unsure kind of demeanor. So Sam walks out into the middle of the floor, ready to meet her secret admirer, and she hears a boy's voice from behind her. Do you know you're standing precisely in the middle of the dance floor? She's all excited. She's like, oh gosh, it's him, it's Nomad. But alas, she turns around to greet him and it's actually just this annoying kid named Terry, played by that guy from The Big Bang Theory. He starts doing a stupid dance, which is supposed to be funny, I guess. But something was off. It's like the, the timing's off, you know? It wasn't funny at all, but what I actually did find funny is that he allegedly doesn't recognize Sam because of her little 
eye mask. And he knows who she is because they showed him talking to her earlier in the movie. And by talking to her, I mean saying words without moving his mouth. Zion, Lieutenant Terry here. Lieutenant Terry, Lieutenant, why you always lying? But anyway, he doesn't recognize her, neither do her own stepsisters. They see her, but they don't know it's her because of her very deceiving mask. Can we all acknowledge that putting holes in a piece of fabric and putting it right here is not a disguise? Hey, I know that girl from somewhere. Yeah, who could that possibly be? I definitely don't recognize my own stepsister that I live with, hair color, height, body type, mannerisms, and entire lower tooth thirds of face. It's a mystery. Anyway, Terry dips out and Austin comes up and then she realizes that he is in fact Nomad. Austin Ames? But instead of being excited, she's kind of disappointed. She's like, Austin Ames? Really? I wanted a real man. I'm not a creep who makes weird faces when he's texting. But he's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm misunderstood. I'm not the homecoming prince football captain douche lord you think I am. I'm actually a really, really deep poet. Closet poet? By the way, he too does not recognize Sam even though she literally waited on him at the diner one hour prior. So Austin invites Sam outside. Carter's really excited about it. Oh. The mustache makes it creepy. So they walk outside and can I just say, wherever they're homecoming is being held is insanely beautiful. Mine was always in my school's cafeteria. What gives? <laughs> Look at this freaking place. I want to take a selfie there for Insta. I'm gonna take an Insta pic. <laughs> so they're walking along. They're playing 20 questions. Remember that game? It's really romantic. But meanwhile, back inside, laughing guy is being very aggressive to Shelby Cummings. No, stop it. But thankfully, Zorro slash Carter steps in to save the day. The way you said stop. Oh, yeah. There ends up being this ridiculous chase scene between Laughing Guy and Carter. Carter ends up smoking him in the face with the bar door thing. And it really knocks him for a loop. That is some solid acting. Very believable. Like I was there. The point of this scene is that Shelby Cummings ends up coming around the mountain for Carter. <laughs> So, Austin and Sam. Are they talking about us? No. These two. Go to bed, kids. Aunt Jamie's watching you. They start slow dancing on the gazeeb. This band that's there starts playing. <laughs> By the way, did your homecoming have a three person band that hung out outside where no one else was waiting for teenagers to come slow dance so they could impromptu serenade them? Mine neither. But anyway, this scene was kind of romantic, but I just felt like it could have been a little more romantic, I don't know. I feel like you made the right choice meeting me here tonight. Mm, yeah. And to you, <laughs> Austin Ames. <laughs> Wanna go get some salmon pudding with me later? Mm. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. So guys, just before Austin rips off her mask, Sam's phone alarm goes off reminding her that she's gotta get back to work at the Salmon Shack. <laughs> so she runs off and in true Cinderella fashion, her dress is dirty AF, but suddenly sparkling clean when she makes it up the steps. She drops her phone. I thought she was gonna drop her slipper, but whatever. If the flip phone fits. So then Fiona shows up to pick up the cat twins and she's very upset that they didn't win homecoming queen. You don't look upset. Huh, oh, it's the Botox. I can't show emotion for another hour and a half. Thank God she agreed to this role because otherwise it's unwatchable. <laughs> So the stepsisters end up spotting Sam in the car next to them, and then it is a race to get back to the diner. It gets so funny and zany. <laughs> they pass the same Jiffy Lube, not once, not twice, but thrice. Hey, isn't that a band name? <laughs> so Fiona gets to the diner and she's on to them. She's like, where is she? The employees are stalling for her. It's very stressful. You don't know if she's gonna get caught or not. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she's like, <laughs> Damn. Fiona's not buying it though. There's something stinks around here. And it's not the fish. Are you sure? Because there is salmon everywhere. <laughs> so then Carter ruins everything. Crashes his dad's car into the restaurant sign. <laughs> Or actually, I guess that this guy crashes his car, this very obvious stunt double that's twice his age. <laughs> I think it's break time, friends. I'm parched and I need to check on my bird. And then we will be right back. See you soon. 
Hey friends, we're back. And I forgot to tell you something. So throughout this movie, there's several like little recurring things, but one of them that I forgot to tell you about is that the area where they live, which I think is like San Fernando Valley, California, they're in the middle of a really bad drought and it is brought up and referred to several times in the movie for absolutely no reason at all. We're in the middle of a drought. Droughts are for poor people. Here's your daily drought reminder to conserve agua. Just keep that in mind. So we're back at school. It's the Monday after the dance. The school DJ is announcing things about Austin Ames during the morning announcements. Austin Ames was crowned prince of the homecoming dance. Oh, big shocker there. Where have we seen that before, guys? <gasps> Wait, is this a Robert Isco film? Oh, never mind. It's Mark Rosman. They must be friends. So Sam walks into school only to find that Austin has put the word out. He literally made fly just so that he could find her. And the flyers are like magical flyers. They just keep moving on their own. Laughing Boy's also there. He's being annoying as ever. That's hot and kinky, baby. You know what I'm saying? Can I get one? Let me get a pal, baby. So Sam and Carter are kind of chatting about how neither Shelby nor Austin know that they're in love with them because they were both wearing Zorro masks, you know? And meanwhile, another girl looks at the camera while <laughs> Sam and Carter are talking. Do I look so fun? <laughs> anyway, Sam and Carter make a deal. She will reveal her identity to Austin when he reveals his to Shelby. The day you told Shelby it was you, I'll tell Austin it was me. Stressful. A little bit later on, Austin and Sam lock eyes in the hallway when they're passing each other, but the magical moment is short-lived because in true Hayden Panettiere fashion, Sam smokes her head on a locker. <laughs> Can we get some new material? Someone please, I challenge you, somebody write a teen rom-com where the main character doesn't hit their head or fall. Bet you can't do it. So Shelby is talking to her friends, Astrid and Medicine? <laughs> Medicine. Wait, what? Oh, her character's name is Madison. Okay, that was weird. Madison. Anyway, Shelby is just gushing over her whole encounter with Zorro and how great it was. And so Carter ends up working up the nerve to walk over and reveal himself to Shelby Cummings. And shockingly, it doesn't work out. Who is he? That's Carter Farrell. He's the guy you cheat off of in Algebra 2. The freak who hums show tunes? It turns out Shelby wasn't really mentally present during their encounter at the dance because she was like tripping on NyQuil or something. I drank a whole bottle of NyQuil. By the way, kids, you really shouldn't do that. Looks like Shelby won't be coming around the mountain anytime soon. <laughs> Back at home, Jennifer Coolidge is making some cool noises. Uh -huh. She's going through the mail and she realizes that Sam got accepted to Princeton. But Fiona doesn't want Sam to go to Princeton. She can't lose her. Sam is like, she brings her salmon breakfast. 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 Fiona ends up hiding the Princeton acceptance letter. Scandalous. Meanwhile, Chad also got accepted to Princeton. Can't tell his dad, remember, because his dad really wants him to go to USC. Austin, don't you know the solution to this problem? How do you not know this? All you gotta do is walk up to your dad and say, I don't want your life. <laughs> I had to. So guys, conflict alert. The evil stepsisters get on Sam's computer and they find out that Sam is the mystery Cinderella from the dance that everybody is talking about. Sam is Cinderella? They didn't know that, even though they literally saw her. So they separately go up to Austin's work to try and like seduce him and convince him that they are Cinderella. I just thought it was weird that they like didn't discuss this beforehand because they both discovered the information at the exact same time in the same room. Plan your scandals better girls. Well anyway their plan doesn't work because Austin is clever and he asks them a question that they can't answer. The girl that I met at the dance she dropped something on her way out. What was it? A fish! A fish. A fish, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what she dropped. She dropped a fish. You slapped a fish. A salmon to be exact. Man, what a weird movie. What a weird comedy. So anyway, they end up getting really mad at each other for thwarting each other's plans. The shorter one chases the taller one directly <laughs> into the car wash. It was the only place for her to run. Directly into an active car wash. <laughs> This is top-notch comedy, y'all. They couldn't even have them get off the car during the hot wax part and like stand on the side where there's clearly enough room. It's so ridiculous. However, I will say, I'm glad that they didn't because without this scene, we would have to go the rest of our lives without this. 
They look like little auburn-haired Cynthia's. The Dingbat twins take their plans to sabotage Sam's life to the next level. They go to Shelby Cummings and they tell her that this big fat lie about how Sam actually created this whole scheme just so she could steal Austin away from Shelby. They even go to the DJ girl and they give her a fake message from Austin even though it's from them. Cinderella? If you're listening, your, your prince, prince wants to rendezvous with you after the pet rally. rally. Doesn't say where though. Could be the cafeteria, could be the janitor's closet. I guess we'll never know. By the way, why hasn't Sam mentioned or even shown any concern whatsoever about the fact that her literal cell phone is missing? <laughs> any other teenage girl would have been beside herself. Yes, even in the early 2000s. We cared about our flip phones, okay? I was in high school at this time and I could not go very long without T9 texting on my razor. Laugh out loud. So friends, we have to take one more a short break feel free to refuel and rehydrate because when we come back it's the pep rally see you there Hey friends, we're back with me realizing I could sit way closer to my camera now because I don't have all this makeup in front of me. So it's time for the pep rally. So Shelby Cummings has put together a last minute little sketch to teach Austin and Sam a lesson. So this skit that she has put together is actually the story of her, Austin and Sam's like love triangle. She doesn't use any names technically, but it's obviously she's talking about Austin. Once upon a time, there was a big, strong fighting frog. <laughs> He had a beautiful girlfriend, and his dad owned the biggest pond in all the land. But and she takes it really far. They even go so far as to like read the emails that they found on Sam's computer. Dear Nomad, I want you to know who I am, but I'm scared. To the entire school to make fun of their love story. Can I just say how terribly they did this scene? I mean, I know that goes without saying, but first of all, Austin's dad is like instantly angry. Like instead of being protective over his son, who is currently being humiliated in front of the entire school, He's like, any ideas about this? And the audience is just dying laughing hysterically as if it's even slightly or remotely funny. Look at this guy. <laughs> He's like, ah, ha, ha, these teenagers bullying other teenagers is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Oops, I forgot I'm not supposed to make that face. My mom said I'll get stuck like that. You know this face? So anyway, the cat is out of the bag. Shelby reveals that Sam is Princeton girl. And instead of like running to her or doing anything chivalrous, Austin just looks at her like as though she did something wrong. While everyone else is chanting, diner girl, diner girl. Yeah, you have a job. <laughs> what a loser. I like how this guy chants it. <laughs> We need to work on your timing, friend. Sam runs home crying, understandably. Hilary Duff is good at crying, for real. She gets like real tears. So while she's down on her luck, Fiona comes in and makes it worse by giving her a fake Princeton letter that says she was denied. Fiona is a liar, she's evil, and I wanna be mad at her, but I just can't because Jennifer Coolidge is so funny. You want a cookie? Mmm. <laughs> So Sam goes back to school. She does the walk of shame down the hallway. Austin sees her and doesn't say anything. I am genuinely confused here. What is Austin mad about? Are you actually mad that she's a losery diner girl? Like neither of you knew who each other were when your romance started. Neither of you told each other where you worked. So there shouldn't be any expectations about what her job was or anything. What's your problem, Austin? Go back to who you were in the beginning with the weird faces. I sure hope you can make some good mashed potatoes. Otherwise, I'll kick your butt. So anyway, Sam is super sad. It's a really bad day for everybody except for these extras in the background who are having the time Bye. of their lives. <laughs> Relax, guys, you're just extras. Just kidding, I wish I was an extra. Back at the diner, Hilary Duff falls. But this time it's a serious fall, but nonetheless still a fall and therefore we have to add it to our female protagonist fall montage that keeps getting longer and longer with each episode of the series. <laughs> Anyway, she's like, look, Rhonda, I have given up. Okay, I'm diner girl. Princeton doesn't want me. Chad Michael Murray doesn't want me. I'm definitely not supermodel hot or anything. It's time for me to accept that I'm 
just a salmon slinger. Until suddenly, her idiot stepsisters walk in, they bust open the door and they knock a guitar off the wall, which reveals a quote etched there many moons ago by her late father. Never let the fear of striking out keep me from playing the game. Isn't that special? I guess the entire back of that guitar was just covered in like glue or something. So Sam sees her father's quote and she is suddenly inspired. And right then and there, she quits the diner, like on the spot. I quit. And then literally everyone else quits too. Rhonda quits. She intimidates Fiona. I'm kicking your butt. Oh, come on, no. Not my face, it's much newer than the girls. Go for the girls. <laughs> Even the customers are quitting. This guy's taking his tot. Things are not going well for Fiona. So back at Rhonda's, Rhonda is being the best person ever. She immediately lets Sam move in. And I just have a question. Why didn't you guys do this sooner? Actually, no, I totally get it. Hence the reason I was a hairstylist for 10 years without ever actually liking it that much. <laughs> takes guts to quit a job. So anyway, Sam tells Rhonda that there's something she has to do tonight and not to wait up for her. Cut over to the football game. Sam's stepsisters are dancing and hurting peeps. A literal kick to the face. Could it possibly be more dramatic? The cheerleaders are down there dancing and um, hold on, where's like the opposing football team? Or literally anyone, why are the stands empty on the other side of the field? <laughs> I guess the other team has no fans or coaches or anything. Well, anyway, before the football game, Sam ends up storming through the boys' locker room in true never been kissed fashion. Oh my God, boom mic, boom mic, boom mic, boom mic. <laughs> <laughs> I like when I find those. It's fun for me. What was I saying? Yeah, she storms into the guy's locker room. She goes off on Austin, rightfully so, right? Why did he suddenly stop talking to her after he found out who she was? And then she proceeds to say my favorite line in the whole movie. Because waiting for you is like waiting for rain in this drought. Useless and disappointing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the only reason that the drought side plot existed. <laughs> was so Hilary Duff could say that terrible line. Waiting for rain in this drought. Bravo. So Sam and Carter decide to stay for the football game. They're sitting in the stands. Wait, what did that girl just say? I've been shopping for large shirts. It's heating up, okay? The frogs are winning. Everyone's chanting Austin's name. What? Besides this guy. So a lot of bad chanters in this movie. But before he can decide on what play he wants to do, he looks into the stands and he sees Sam leaving and he's like, you know what? I'm out of here. I quit football in the name of AOL chat love. His dad's like, Austin, you're throwing away your dream. And Austin's all like, no dad, I'm throwing away yours. Didn't see that line coming. <laughs> Oh, big shocker there. He runs into the stands and kisses Sam and oh, he's all sweaty. But he's got a real salty upper lip. <laughs> It's true, I once dated a hockey player. It's pretty gross. So at the end of the movie, everything starts falling into place. After that, it was like everything fell into place. Hillary ends up opening that Cinderella storybook that her dad was reading her the night he died in the earthquake. And it turns out that he did have a will and it was left in that Storybook. But I wanna I wanna know who hid it in this book though, okay? Because it's not there the night he dies in the earthquake when they're reading the book. So clearly he died before he could leave it for her. So the other option is that Fiona did it. But if Fiona didn't want Sam to find it, why would she put it in Sam's storybook? Plot hole. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's plot hole. Nothing I can do. It's plot hole. Anyway, they confront Fiona about the will, and Fiona's like, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. Wait, did Jennifer Coolidge literally get her lips done for this part? Because that looks crazy real, like actual lip fillers. Or maybe she just did that Kylie Jenner challenge that was real popular for a while. Remember that? <laughs> Oh. Anyway, long story long, Fiona is a liar. Not only did she know about the will, but she signed it and did not properly execute it, which means she's in big, bad trouble. I'm afraid you're gonna have to come downtown with me, man. 
Well, that hidden will. Her sister somehow knew where to find Sam's real Princeton acceptance letter, which again is a weird plot hole because A, Sam doesn't know that she was actually accepted to Princeton. So someone would have had to tell her, which I can't see either of the stepsisters doing, right? Because they both hate her and it's not like they're suddenly friends now. And second of all, how could it possibly still be in the garbage can after it's been in there for like three weeks? <laughs> Fiona ends up having to be a floor scrubber at the diner as part of her community service. Rhonda becomes the boss, which is super fun. Of course, it all works out. Carter becomes a successful actor. He does a commercial. Shelby Cummings comes around the mountain for Carter. <laughs> Last time, I promise. Carter also landed the girl. And then Austin and Sam go to Princeton together and it just all works out so cheerily and just like Cinderella, they live happily ever. After. And that's the end of the movie, y'all. What do you guys think? It definitely isn't the worst one I've ever reviewed, um, but it had the most mistakes. I couldn't even list them all. I found so many. Just like weird editing mistakes. There's a couple scenes where I could see their tape on the ground for where the actors were supposed to hit their mark, and it was just very poorly edited. I'm just saying. So the budget for this film was $19 million. That's a a lot. Opening weekend in the US, it brought in 13623350 dollars and the gross worldwide combined profits was $70 million. $67,909. That is an amazing profit, and I hope a big fat portion of it went into Jennifer Coolidge's pocket for making this movie watchable for all of us. So, this review comes from an IMDb user named Sacto Dog, and it is entitled Cinder Flop. I normally wouldn't have even bothered with this movie. After all, I am not in the age group that this is directed to, and of course, this type of movie always plays well with women of all ages. I do have to say, the guy, Chad Michael Murray, was pretty good, and in time, he may become a good actor. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're not a guy, right? But Hilary Duff is a one-trick horse actress. She will never make it as an adult actress. Let's hope she's been saving up her money for acting classes. Donna A. Thank you, Donna, for signing your name. It's like when your great aunt sends you a text and you know it's her because her number's stored in your phone, but then she signs it. Hi, Jamie. Loved your show on the YouTube. Love, Aunt Donna. <laughs> As always, friends, I'm very curious to know what you thought about this. Like most of the movies I talk about, it had some potential, it had some funny moments, mostly in the form of Jennifer Coolidge, but overall it was just not good. And I'm probably gonna watch it again when I stop filming this because it's kind of like a guilty pleasure for me now. So if you're still here, just as a reminder that this is my last episode before I take my little hiatus, we have one more video going up, which is gonna be like a Q&A about my rebrand and everything, anything you guys wanna talk about. And then I won't see you for a while, isn't that? sad. <laughs> While I'm gone, I recommend that you binge this series. This is actually not the first time that I have done one of these without doing my makeup. I reviewed the movie Rad from the 80s. That one has slightly lower views, so if you haven't, if you happen to be someone who hasn't seen it, you should check it out because that movie was amazing. I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> But as you know, even though I'm taking a break, I will be coming back with plenty more movie reviews, so still feel free to leave your suggestions down below for the next one. Thank you so much for your response to me leaving the beauty community. Oh my god. There's literally 8,000 comments right now on that video, which is... Like, I feel like that amount of comments is like what you would get on a video that had like 10 million views or something. Like, so many of you chose to speak up and support me and I appreciate it so much. It's hard to drag this video out. <laughs> Look out for the Q&A and I will see you guys soon in an updated studio and format and personality. Bye! Gonna be great. No, that don't look great. Mama don't get dressed up for nothing. One, two, three. Who has? She's the toughest fire, power buff, save the day. You can tell it's an earthquake, because the way it is. Rolling on the floor, laughing hilariously. Hysterically. Ooh, this makes me look like a full, full football player. Can you show me again? I think it's too close. Baby, this looks so good. Sam, you gotta say it too. I'm sick. Okay. Shelby Cummings around the mountain when she <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can you imagine having to wait on the cool kids? Can you not do that? Is it real this time or is it in my head?
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So why don't you get up? <laughs> I'm so distracted by how often you're doing that. It's all right. It's all right. What if I just... No. No. Maybe if I just... No. I'll kick your butt. Which is to just have Hilary Duff use different voices. Are they talking about us? Where are you alone?